How are you? Welcome. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about talking to your teenagers about sexuality. And let me just pull up my notes here. Um, I want to just give you a few ideas just, just to kind of start with. Those of you who've taken my How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex course will probably already have some of these ideas in your mind, but I just want to give them as kind of anchoring ideas uh, that then I can sort of reference as, as I'm going through some of the questions that people wrote. Just a second, let me just pull this a little bigger. So, you know, one of the things that is, first of all, if you're a little stressed about how to do this well, you're in good company, it's not easy to talk to our kids about sexuality because of first our own anxieties about it, the fact that kids both need that direction but don't want to get it from you, um, and also because we live in a society currently that's highly sexual, and, uh, and so your kids are getting immersed in sexual ideas and content, whether or not we want them to, whether or not it's good for them, and so it means parents to do it well have to be thoughtful and involved, um, which is not comfortable or easy. And a lot of you are asking good questions around what is the moderate position? Like, I don't wanna shame my kids, but I also value that they are wise and thoughtful and careful. I don't want that to, you know, shame them around modesty, but I also don't want them wearing, you know, uh, Daisy Duke shorts around all the time. And so how do I do this well? So, um, so the fact of even trying is a big deal. I really do mean that to just care about it and care about doing it thoughtfully is half the battle because if your child tracks that you care about them enough, to care how they handle this, it's good. It doesn't mean your kids aren't gonna make mistakes. They are going to. Um, it doesn't mean that whatever they choose is gonna just you know, work out perfectly for them, but it is a process of learning and that's good and it's okay and each child's gonna be different and sometimes you're gonna overcorrect and sometimes you're gonna undercorrect and that's just part of being a parent is forgiving the fact that you don't always know the best way to do it. So, so some of the ideas I wanna just kinda of lay out um, as foundational ideas is that we want our kids to know and feel from us that we know that sexuality is a normal and necessary part of being a human being, right? And a lot of us are like, still sort of think of it as a necessary evil or we're really ambivalent around whether or not our kids whether or not we want them to become sexual beings. And so the more that we really do think of sexuality not as a necessary evil, but just a normal part of the human experience. And in addition to that idea, how you relate to it has a big impact on you, on others and your relationships. And so whether or not you have peace and joy in life has a lot to do with how you relate to this very human, this very you know normal part of being a human being. In my view, uh, being immoderate in either direction will cause suffering. So we are all very clear that being immoderate in a kind of indulgent way, being you know a, a, a porn addict, a sex addict, being compulsive in any way around sexuality is unhealthy. Um, but in my view, it's also equally unhealthy and equally anti-spiritual to be in a repressed, anxious uh, position because both are fear-driven, both are anxiety-driven, and both have a negative impact on self and or other. And so you can't really deny the gift of sexuality. God has, our parents in heaven have given it to us whether or not you think it was a good idea of them. <laughs> And so how you are relating to it is gonna make a big difference. So you, you, you don't really have a choice about whether or not you address sexuality. How you address it is gonna have real implications for your life. So the best way, um, okay, the other thing I would say is that anxiety or fear is going to interfere with that integration of your sexuality. And so 
you know, compulsive behavior is anxiety driven and repressive behavior is anxiety driven. So the best way as a parent to reduce anxiety is to normalize the fact of sexuality and to facilitate giving your children direction around their sexuality. Um, so rather, and then second and kind of very parallel is that your child is the architect of their life around sexuality, not that the sexuality controls them. So a lot of us give these ideas of slippery slopes and you're right on a cliff and you're gonna drive off the edge if you get anywhere near it and so on. And while those I think are well-intentioned messages, if we're giving the idea that sexuality is stronger than us or sexuality is Satan's pathway, we're undermining our children's ability to be choosers and um, agents of their sexuality. Now, that's not to deny that sexuality isn't a strong um, and powerful desire within us, that um, it can certainly lull us into things that are unhealthy for us, that all those things are true. Um, but recognizing that's true while continuing to say, I get to decide how I relate to this is very, very important because it gives the child a real sense of being the chooser and the decider, even though they still may recognize that it's a powerful aspect of being human. Um, so you can say it's a powerful part of being human, it's an important language, and so how we relate to it matters, but ultimately you're gonna decide who you are around this. Um, okay. Let me just see, does anybody have any questions about just what I've said so far before I take up some questions? Oh yeah, have you considered doing a course geared directly for teens? I've taken your courses and implemented them and I would still love to have my daughter hear your insights directly, speaking to her instead of, a, okay, that's a good idea. That's something Christy's been trying to get me to do too. <laughs> Christy has a long list of things for me to do. But anyway, love her anyway, okay. <laughs> but yes, I may do that. And um, I think that could be helpful. So um, my husband does say, it's like if your course, how to talk to your kids about sex, if it was how, how to have Jennifer, <laughs> like, exactly, how to have Jennifer talk to your kids about sex, um, that maybe I would sell more. <laughs> okay, so, but I will seriously consider that. Okay, this person asks, when is it appropriate to start discussing sex as being more than vaginal intercourse with your kids? Have you handled situations like this? My 12 year old was visiting with his cousin and for some reason decided to quote Bill and Ted's excellent adventure where Bill and Ted ask their future selves what their favorite number is and they enthusiastically reply 69 dude. His aunt, instead of just letting it go because he probably didn't know what they were referring to or asking why he thought that was their favorite number before deciding how to respond, decided to instead tell him to not say 69 because it was a bad number like it was on par with a four letter cuss word. So he comes home and asks me why 69 is a bad number. I neglected to correct him about the number being quote unquote bad, the subtle ways that we reinforce sex is bad, right? But I said, well, because it refers to something to do with sex, do you want me to explain? He said he thought he was old enough that he should know. So I explained that sometimes sex isn't just penis and vagina, but that sometimes people use their hands or mouths on their partner's genitals. The shocked expression on his face was priceless, <laughs> but it quickly passed, that's awesome. Then I explained the positioning that led to 69. He thought that it was a real stretch to call that a 69. <laughs> oh, kids are so awesome. Okay, so, um, so going back to the original question of when is it, I mean, first of all, I think the parent handled this very well, actually. So she's being matter of fact about it. She's answering his question. I mean, he's a little bit like, holy what, you know? <laughs> Mouths can go on genitals. Um, and so he's having an appropriate response, but he, the, the mom here is giving the message, which I think is a very important one, that she can handle his questions, that uh, she's not overwhelmed by it. She's being matter of fact and giving him information that he needs. And I think that is more important than the issue of content per se. So that is to say a lot of parents get afraid, like if I answer that now he knows such a thing exists, is that gonna not just lead him to want to do it? 
I think actually because it's low anxiety, mom can handle it. She's not overwhelmed. She's able to answer my question. Um, that all sets a foundation of just him being able to be curious, but not overwhelmed and information seeking, but not afraid of what it all means because anxiety can also create Again, some of you have heard me say this ad nauseum at this point, so I'm sorry for those of you who are familiar with my work, but a lot of times I'll use just the framing of food because it's so it's more intuitive for us that if we were to react to the fact that human beings like sweets with all kinds of judgment and harshness, we drive an anxiety that makes you either fully step away from it, you know, like anorexia, or getting compulsive because the anxiety and the fear, like I shouldn't like these sweets or I, I can't because this makes me bad, drives the compulsivity, right? And we do this with porn all the time unwittingly. Is So this mother's matter of fact response is really good. I also think 12 and even sooner if needed is okay to talk about the fact that sex feels good and that you know, sexuality is a lot about sharing pleasure with the person you love and expressing love through that pleasure, through that offering of pleasure, through the receiving of pleasure, and that this is a way to be able to fully be yourself with the person you choose to marry down the road. And so you can, you can definitely be clear about the fact of it. In fact, you can be clear right in these initial conversations that it feels good. And even if it's overwhelming to you right now, when you're an adult and you love someone, this will sound appealing to you. This will be a desirable thing. And um, the kind of freedom to love and be loved in this way will feel much more intuitive as you get older. So again, just being matter of fact about the pleasure diffuses it from being this compelling, anxiety evoking, Thing that you think you have to hide or sneak away from that interferes with this healthy integration yes i think it's fine for kids to listen to what i'm going to say today i think but at the end i decide no then you don't don't need to but um okay i think i got everything all right um how can it, we adults is another question that as was posted in the group how can we adults who have been part of a culture of shame repent and heal relationships is there a point where it's too late to teach our children healthy attitudes about sex? Well, clearly when your kids leave the house, of course you're gonna have less impact because they're not subjected to your minds as much as they are when they are living under your roof. However, parents continue to have meaningful impact on their children, even when they're adults. And so I, I think, first of all, one of the best ways to repent, to use that language, or one of the best ways to help your kids is to just shift in your thinking yourself because your kids will feel it. Whether or not we want to, we map each other's minds, we map our parents' minds, and so we are tracking the way that they think or the way that they're shifting in their relationship to themselves or their faith or their spouse, you know, and so we are tracking that and referencing that mind as, as you become an adult, right, as your child becomes an adult. Um, I'm just thinking back to when I was becoming an adult and seeing some of the changes that were happening within my parents in the way they thought and the way they related to each other. And so I continued to reference that and it mattered in my own freedom as a human being. So, um, so I think that's true. So the more that you shift your own thinking, that's very helpful no matter the age your kids. You can also more explicitly go and say, you know, this is the paradigm that I inherited and, and this is what I kind of offered to you. I thought it was the best thing. This is how I'm thinking about it differently now. This is, I, I think this was, you know, that what I said here was not the right idea, even though it was intended to protect you. I think differently about it now and this is how I've been thinking about it lately. That's very helpful to your kids because it just allows them to consider what they've internalized, but then to consider another way of thinking about it. And it, and it gives them permission to think differently. I remember my mom saying to me at a certain point, like that she was glad I was doing the work I was doing, that she was sorry that she wasn't able to offer a better understanding of sexuality. And that was just, 
very valuable for me because it was an explicit acknowledgement that um, there's much to be desired and understood and I'm glad that you are finding that clarity for yourself and able to offer it to others. And because it, it just allows you to not sort of be beholden to a loyalty that you think exists that may not exist. So being clear about where you stand and um, it just, it's just never too late. I mean, I think that a lot of times it, we might have, if we'd started younger, we might have spared our kids some pain or spared them some misconception, but that is life. I don't know how other, there's no other way to do it. Some fantasy that we should know and have it all figured out and be able to offer it perfectly to our children and spare them any suffering or pain is fantasy land. It just isn't, it, it, our kids deserve their own struggles and their development that comes through those struggles. And uh, doing our best means be being willing to see where we are wrong and self-correct and um, acknowledge that. And to be earnest in offering our best as imperfect as that is. And if a child gets that, they're very, very, very fortunate. So it's never too late to love your children. It's never too late to self-correct. So um, absolutely, okay. Um, scrolling up here, okay. This person says, how do I react to address a spontaneous erection to my son? Is it helpful to acknowledge and address or let him have his privacy? I'd let him have his privacy. He's already probably horrified. <laughs> now, at another moment, you might give him a book about puberty or you might have a conversation about the fact that this is a normal part of adolescence because he may not know that, but I certainly wouldn't react in the moment. I, would, I just would afford him his privacy and his dignity. Um, and um, yeah, and I, I certainly think it's okay to offer kids like a, a book that gives them information they need because you're handing it to them is to say, you know, I want you to be educated and to know, but it gives them some privacy so they don't have to reference your mind the whole time that they're learning about these things. If it's a father to a son or a mother to a daughter, I think it's a little bit easier and better because it's more like, you know, woman to woman or woman to young woman or man to young man. It's, it's got more of a kind of, um, it's not as embarrassing. They know the experience. You know your parent knows the experience. So, um, okay. Um, this person writes, just a second, give me one second. Um, my, sorry, my 12 year old son has a girlfriend. This is my oldest son out of four boys. So I've been struggling to know how to best approach this. We have had a lot of good conversations about not attaching to one specific person at this age and viewing them as another person you'd like to spend time with but not neglecting your other friends. Yesterday, he told me that he had his first kiss with her while they were hanging out at our house. She kissed him, asked him if he wanted to, so yay for consent. They were outside and I guess I didn't think I needed to be watching their every move. I told him how I know this time in his life is filled with a lot of exciting firsts, but to not rush into things. He's pretty impulsive and seeks attention and validation through others. I just feel he's so young for all this, but then I remember myself at that age, which is important because you very well may have a child who's similar to you in terms of puberty and curiosity and so on and novelty seeking. So I'll come back to that. We've talked about an appropriate age to really start dating, but he gets defensive if I try to encourage him to use different terms than boyfriend or girlfriend. He's very open with me and we have great conversations, but I know I have to tread carefully with certain topics. I'm also really open about sexual questions, respecting women, body positivity, etc. My husband, however, is against any type of dating talk and gets annoyed easily when it's brought up, which has caused my son to stop talking to him and only to me. So my question is this, have I been too lax in my approach to allow him to hang out with just her, even if it's in our own home? And if so, is it too late to dial this back? And how do I deal with him wanting a girlfriend so young without pushing him to just keep things hidden from me in the future? Also, how do I get my husband to see that he's just shaming our son for his feelings? Okay, um, so 
first of all, again, I think you're doing a good job because you're aware and you care about it. And I want to just say that I have been fortunate. My husband and I both were very unusually late hitting puberty. So that sort of was horrifying for my kids because, <laughs> you know, with all the social awkwardness, they're like way smaller than their peers and things like that. Um, and so, but the good news for us as parents <laughs> is that we haven't had to deal with a lot of these challenges. Like people whose kids hit puberty early and or, and my kids are all a little bit on the anxious and quiet side, okay? And so that's also been helpful <laughs> to us as parents, not to them. <laughs> but, you know, this also a lot how John and I were growing up. And so, um, so the, the, the reason I'm saying this is that when a parent has a child who's both socially like precocious and um, has hit puberty earlier and has sexual interest earlier, you're up against a pretty big challenge in that their, mature, their sexual maturity has outpaced their emotional maturity. And often they, they are wanting that novelty, they want the thrill of it. Um, when you have kids like mine who are a little bit anxious, they kind of hold back and psychologically, you know, they have a lot more time and that's very helpful. So I know I'm gloating right now <laughs> and I'm not trying to be, I'm just trying to sort of have some compassion with you for the fact that it's not easy. I think what would be helpful for you is to think back on your, and I'm sure you've done this, but think back on your 12 year old self and think about sort of what you wanted and what do you think would have been protective and most helpful for you at the time. I think the best parents are able to hold limits and have high expectations without shaming. So they're highly involved. I don't mean that they're overbearing, but they're involved enough to be aware, much like this parent is, but willing to hold limits that serve the child, even though it may make the child upset. So you can hold those limits without being even slightly shaming. I think this question comes up on another one if we have time for it. You can say, no, this isn't allowed, and that doesn't equate with shaming. And so you can dial it back and say, look, you are precocious, and that's part of what I love about you is you're adventurous and smart and socially able and curious. Um, but because I love you, that means I, we're gonna hold some limits and some um, structure around it to just give you a little bit more time. And you can say that without any shame whatsoever. It's because I love you, it's because I care about you that we're gonna hold those limits. And you know, ex and then you don't need to like it and I understand that you have all that and that's good, but I don't want you to have more freedom than is good for you. And he will certainly not like it. I mean, I'm sure, but that's different than he will know that it's because you love him. And that makes a difference. When I've held expectations of my kids, often they will meet with, you're the worst, you know, that's terrible and be upset, but they actually will settle down and days later express some gratitude or some warmth, which for me is like an indication of they know that what I'm doing is about their well-being and they respect it and, um, and they are grateful for it. They just might not tell you in the moment that they want something, but they are glad to know that someone's looking after them and holding limits on their behalf. Um, let me see if there's any other questions here. Uh, when you're explaining things and not mincing words, do you recommend saying something along the lines of, you can talk to me about this whenever you want, but really talking about it with friends or cousins isn't the best idea? Um, I'm just thinking about that. Um, what, what I might say is, I, first of all, I do think it's good to say, you can always talk to me and you can ask me anything. Um, I might say this depending on the age of the child and if they're young, you know, if they're pre-adolescent, I might say, you know, it's sometimes interesting to talk about it, but because 
other families will relate to this differently. It is a way of respecting other people to not bring up topics of sexuality because it may be different than how their family thinks about it or wants their kids to relate to it. If your cousins are bringing it up, that will be interesting. You can always ask me about it because a lot of times, even if well-intentioned, other people and other families have different ideas or ideas that I think are not that helpful. So I don't know if I would say like, don't do it, but I think I'd give some qualifiers around the, perhaps them not initiating conversations with younger friends. Um, and if other people are bringing it up that, you know, that oftentimes they may have ideas that are kind of wrong about it and that you are a resource. Um, that's how I would handle it. Let's see. Okay, it seems like I don't feel I could be more open and share things that are a little more revealing without the caveat that this isn't really to be discussed with just anyone and everyone. Yes. Um, what if Matt, mom and dad are not on the same page? Dad is old school and mom is new school. We have three boys. Yeah, I think that's a little bit similar to this question. And, you know, I think what I would really say is, you know, to keep uh, duking it out with your spouse around that. Um, <laughs> around what's a position we can both be comfortable with and what is it that I think and why do you think what you think and how can we, is there a shared position we can come up with? When it comes to actual expectations in the family, that's really important to push through those conversations until you can come up with something you're both at peace enough with. In terms of approach or thinking, you can say, just like you can in, you know, you can say, say the parents have a different political view or different religious views. You can say like, this is how, as long as it's respectful, this is how I think about it. This is how dad thinks about it. This is how I approach this. This is how mom approaches it. If it's just about a way of thinking, I think it's not only fine, I can think it can even be valuable to offer two different honest perspectives. Um, because it allows a child to figure out who they are and what they think, which is really, really important in helping your children be good decision makers. You know, in the my How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex course, I am laying out, you know, the developmental milestones and kind of what sort of interactions the parent has with the child and what kind of information they're offering. Offering what sexuality is about and your values is really most ideal in that sort of 8 to 12 range. Once your kids are going into adolescence, everything in them is about being separate from you. Now, they still need you desperately, but they are trying to you know, define a self outside of the nest. They're trying to get their legs underneath them. And so they're not as open to your perspective at that point, which is not to say that they're not open to it or that you shouldn't be offering who you are, but they are most ideally sorting out their, who they're going to be within the within the freedom that you offer them okay through the rules that you have through the expectations that you have they need enough freedom to start figuring out who they're going to be what they desire what they want and so um you know your children in a kind of that early adolescence or pre-adolescence having some idea of what it is they're aiming for what it is they hope to do around their sexuality how they want to relate to it and to others having those sort of early conversations and decisions allows them to be more of the choosers and the deciders and you more as a reference point. Now I can't even remember why I started saying that. What was my point? Um, oh, dad has a, so, but having two different points of view, dad and mom is a way for them to kind of think more about who are they around this? How do they think about it? What do they want? Um, so, but again, I would, I think it's valuable for you to, um, as parents, to push yourselves around what are the limits and the sort of explicit expectations that you can both feel okay about. Um, okay. This person says, I have a question that has been weighing on my mind for years about pornography and teenagers. We have three teenage boys. They all have smartphones, but they are locked up pretty, much, pretty tight. No internet browsers, YouTube, or social media. They are allowed those things on computers in common areas in the home. I mean, I think that sounds super wise right there. Just gonna tell you that and I'll say why in a minute. 
I don't want to make pornography a forbidden and horrible thing, ultimately driving them to it. But I also don't feel like there is a difference viewing pornography. I think there is a difference viewing pornography as an adult than as a teenager. I agree with that. Our brains don't fully develop until about 25 years old, so I honestly want to give my kids the best chance they have at being healthy adults. Absolutely. My questions... My question to you all is, do I let my teenagers have access to pornography, internet, social media, YouTube on their phones? We have good discussions about sex, masturbation, etc. I just get uncomfortable allowing them to have a porn shop on, in their pockets. Absolutely. Especially since I didn't have it growing up. Also, all their friends have access to those things on their phones. We're definitely stricter than most parents when it comes to what is blocked on their phones. So again, some really good parents out there, okay? Because you're absolutely right in your thinking. I appreciate what you're saying. Like, I don't want to drive shame because shame will often create compulsivity around it. Um, but I think that if you're matter of fact about it, um, it's not shaming. And you're just holding a limit that's there out of a place of love. Okay, so it's that you are basically saying, Kids don't need access to this portal, to anything and everything out there in their back pocket. Not only do they not need it, it's bad for kids. I mean, iPhones are phenomenal, but they are bad for our children and they're bad for us as adults. I mean, unless we really are careful about how we're in relationship to it, because porn aside, it just hijacks your attention and attention is the most precious commodity we have and we can easily waste it away when you just pick up your phone that lights up whenever there's a new message or whatever and you just are sucked into this reactive reality. Not to mention all of the misinformation that's out there, all the kind of content that's compelling but not valuable or good for forging a meaningful life. I think without any apology, holding that limit is really good and being in public places is good too because even just navigating homework, at least for my kids, is so much online um, and it's just, challenging unless they're in a public space to be able to not get sucked into YouTube. I mean, just watching any videos because that's more, that's easier than writing a paper. And so this challenge that our kids have around self-regulation and staying on the tasks that are valuable for their development while they're constantly in this online world, uh, less is more around this a hundred percent. Just even porn as an issue aside. Um, but then especially with porn, because we don't know the impact of porn at that level on the minds and the development of our kids or of adults for that matter. We just don't yet know. But I can't imagine that it's good. I mean, and I, I do recognize what you're saying. You know, I think around food and so on, um, it's very similar where we're just immersed in a very unhealthy food culture. Um, you travel anywhere else in the world and even fast food places have healthy salads, have healthy foods that that's why the society, meaning that, that there's less obesity in those countries is because the food you get easily or comfortably is good for you. Where in America, we just are much more high saturated fats and sugars as just what's easily accessible. And, and that's not good for us. So limiting, you wanna be in the world but not of the world on these fronts because they're, they're just not good for your physical and psychological development. I grew up in a home where there was no shame around sugar, it, but it just never came up because in my household, you'd open up the cupboard to get a school snack and there would be like legumes that you could soak for two hours if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it just cracks you up. Oh, but, you know, there would be like wheat germ. There was wheat you could grind to make flour if you wanted to make, <laughs> make some bread. Um, <laughs> so my point, nobody was shaming sugar. It just kind of wasn't there. And we'd go to ward parties and then we would sort of feast on the ward parties. We loved ward events because that's where we would get sugar. <laughs> and... Um, but importantly, what was happening is I was just getting inculcated into a way of living that was really about healthy food, okay? Healthy experience. So I, I knew it at a cellular level. 
when I went away to college, I was ate more sugar. I, you know, I tried all the things that I thought all the lucky people and I could might go to my friend's house. They'd have like fluff, peanut butter and fluff. <laughs> and they'd have all the things that we definitely knew the friends, we go to my friend's house for food. We sleep at my house because my parents were kind of lax about bedtime. <laughs> but, um, but okay, I'm getting sidetracked here. My, my larger point is that while when I first went to college, I started kind of eating more like my friends had eaten. I was getting fluff and things like that, uh, ramen noodles and so on. And then I promptly put on a lot of weight my freshman year. And I was like, okay, wait, my mom was onto something. Um, and so, but the, the reality was I had this other sort of ingrained reference point that I could choose and go back to out of my own choice. If my mom had shamed it, I think that would have created a lot of trouble. If there'd been this like, you, how dare you eat that at the ward party? I mean, she would kind of say nothing about it. So it was not, um, it, it was more set up that you knew the healthy by not being subjected to the unhealthy, but you, uh, but really it was about choosing and not being shamed into it. So I think you can think of it very similarly around sexuality and, you know, being, critical consumers of what is out there is really valuable um, because if you just let what others dictate be there for your for the taking uh, for your kids it means you're really giving over too much freedom that's beyond what's helpful for them we have girls age 12 to 14 how important is it to explain what's happening to the bodies of boys right now if I had boys, I would want to teach them what is happening to girls' bodies so they have awareness, understanding, and compassion. I'm trying to decide how much to tell about boys. I think there's no reason why not. I mean, I think that, you know, I personally was less interested in what was happening with boys, but it was still valuable to know, to just kind of know that we're all going through it. And, um, and so, I think it's a way of communicating the facts about what it is to be human and just to be comfortable enough to do that is its own valuable message. Um, okay. Uh, I'm hoping for some much needed advice pertaining to teaching modesty to my 12 year old girl. I'm not interested in shame based ideas or focusing it on how others view her. Also, I'm hesitant to bring God or religion into the mix because I'm having a current faith crisis. Also, one day I was desperate and tried it and it backfired. We were talking about why we wear the clothes we do. I wear garments and how I choose clothes that cover my garments and others don't have to because they haven't made those religious covenants. She proceeded to tell me that she wasn't interested in making those covenants then, so yeah. How can I navigate my 12 year old wanting to wear short shorts and crop tops? Uh, we go to the store and she brings me these things and I have only been able to tell her that I'm not sure that I, and I have to research more about how to say what I need to. That's awesome. Um, to say what I need to say about how to feel about wearing these articles of clothing, laugh out loud. I was as vague as possible and she could sense my confusion. I do not know how to articulate without shame. So I feel like I need to just zip my mouth until I learn a better way. She seems to understand and has been giving me time to put my thoughts together, thankfully. I'm highly sensitive to the way that the world is sexualizing girls and women's bodies. I am so confused on how to meet in the middle on this. I grew up strict LDS, no more shame, no more being responsible for others' thoughts or actions, no more sexualizing of our shoulders. Yet the pull that the media and pop culture has feels just as wrong and just as strong in the other direction, which I fully agree with. I think that's just, you know, absolutely we can be sort of go from like, oh, virginal women are the best, the, the non-sexual to, you know, sexually available and sexualized women are the best. And these are still external reference points rather than an internal reference point. So first, I would say that um, tracking what's going on within the child matters. So is it just that, you know, it's what her friends are wearing and she likes looking like her friends? Okay, and, and that doesn't mean that you should say yes to it all, but is that what's going on? Is she wanting the sexual attention? Is that what's driving her interest? Um, if she does want the sexual attention, is that coming, you know, from a place of insecurity? 
Is she trying to get accepted through the clothing or does she just, you know, want to fit in or does she like just looking pretty and, and this for her is pretty and, and you agree with her, like she looks nice in the clothing, even if it's a little more revealed than you think is good. The reason why I'm asking that is because just kind of tracking what's happening and what's my daughter trying to solve or resolve. And you know, one thing that really happens at adolescence is peers become way more important than the parent. Um, yeah, I mean, they just do. <laughs> and, and the parent, no matter how cool, because I like remind my kids that I'm cool, um, is an embarrassment. <laughs> and so they are very much interested in being right with their peers. And so a lot of times it's being driven by that. Now that said, you still have a job to be protective of them. What you're trying to protect is their dignity and that they take themselves seriously enough. So there can be like, I want to go do what my friends want to do. Um, and you want them to have some latitude to make choices, but it's okay to hold limits that you feel ultimately slow down that process, give them time for them to grow up psychologically and and allow them you to blame for things that they can save face with their peers and kind of hold you responsible for what they're not allowed to do. Again, it's the shaming versus, you know, it's trying to control them, shame them, as opposed to standing up for something that you think is good for them. So um, you, can, you could say, look, you look really pretty in that outfit. I'm not going to lie. You're beautiful. I think you look great in it. But it's to that while I don't think that you should be ashamed of your body, like maybe I taught you years ago, or like I was taught, or however you would want to say that, that to be too sexual, to have too much of your legs showing, too much of your body showing, is not cool either. And our society's kind of swung the other way. So I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, Dad and I are not comfortable with it. So. This is not about whether or not you look nice, you absolutely do, but you can't, you, you have to have, you know, whatever the, the expectation is. Because you're getting fed into the idea that you must be sort of showing your sexuality to be attractive. And I want you to have your sexuality and your dignity. I want you to have your self-respect and be at peace with your beauty and your sexuality. And so, um, no. <laughs> you can't wear it. <laughs> and, and so it's not coming out of a shame about her body or her sexuality, but a desire to be protective of her dignity and her strength. That's the difference, right? When, when we like put women, you know, cover them up, it's like shaming them, saying their sexuality is a problem. Exposing women is also exploiting women. If you're protective of the dignity of the, of the child and fostering their self-respect through their choices uh that's the goal and you can think about what that actually means that the what it actually what the meaning is of the clothing that we wear depends a lot on the context in which we are like if we're going to the beach as opposed to taking an exam for example but also the cultural context is always shifting you know when women started wearing skirts in the 1910s that would show their ankle it was scandalous okay and now that's like frumpy or whatever, or, you know, hyper uh, modest. So um, th there is this larger meaning in the culture, but yeah, you, you don't want your daughter to sexualize herself to get attention, which is different than being at peace with her sexuality and comfortable in her own skin. And you don't want her to dress modestly to manage boys' thoughts, but you might want her to, she may want to choose to dress modestly or you're asking her to do that in order to not give a message or sexualize herself in the culture or the environment that she's operating in. And I think it's fine to hold that position because again, you're protecting her dignity That's and, your, and her self-respect. That's the goal. I had a parent in Young Women's ask me if I had any lessons or talks about how to help her daughters with something they are going through at school. Right now it seems really popular to be gay, lesbian, bi in middle and high school. Her girls are being called homophobic because they say they are straight and are Christian. 
They are not homophobic and are quite accepting of others, but are feeling pressured to question their sexual orientation to prove it. I've listened to JFF's How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex, and I've listened to several podcasts addressing LGBTQ community concerns, but haven't heard anything that addresses this in particular. If anyone has any resources that may help, I would be really grateful. So, um, okay, so we have come a long way in society. When I was growing up, like to be, and I didn't even grow up in Utah, I was in Vermont, but to be gay was like to lose all social status. I mean, it was just, there was no upside whatsoever. And, um, and that was even in a non-religious community. Um, it's very, very different for our kids now because thankfully we have made more room for our gay and lesbian uh, sons and daughters to have acceptance in society. There's more room for the variation of somebody who's literally you know, born at a young age and f never feels at home in their body. And so you know, are transgender and are in a society now that can handle that reality, which is very good. I think it's also true that our society is currently very focused on identity and um, those that have been underserved by society. Again, there is strength in that, but there's also liability in it because there's a lot of upside to being a victim. And there's also a lot of upside to taking on an identity of difference because you can sort of use it to feel special or feel important. Teenagers are all about wanting to feel in some way unique, different, special, important. You know, I know as a teenager, I was thinking about changing my name. I mean, I just, I was trying to figure out what identity I was. I had friends who were like changing the color of their hair, being punk, you know, was cool that I didn't do that. but. You know, I had a friend who would wear a dog collar. That was like a way of being different. So there are a lot of kids in the current environment that it's, it's as is in this question, it is interesting or cool to question it and to think about it. And then there's also maybe some fear that's in this question. Like if, if I don't think that way about myself, does that mean that somehow I'm just narrow and limited? All that said, then there's also our kids who are in fact, you know, gay, lesbian, or transgender, or trying to figure out who they are. So again, not an easy time for knowing how to parent in this environment. Again, what I would be thinking about a lot is if we really are a liberal society in the best sense, we make room for each other. Uh, wherever we are, whether that's religious or non-religious, okay, whether that's heterosexual or homosexual, we make room for difference and um, allow people to be true to the best in themselves. With your children, it, again, it sounds like this parent is thinking about it in the right way where her daughters are very accepting of others but are feeling pressured. And just to reinforce for them that you want to afford to others and yourself the room to be true to who you are. And so you don't have to apologize for being heterosexual, right? I mean, if that's the pressure that the daughters are genuinely feeling, uh, just as you don't shame anybody else for being different than you. So we want a society that genuinely makes room for all. We want a society that doesn't use you know, the color of your skin to be an important determinant in whether or not you get a job, whether or not you get respect. Whether, you know, and I mean in any direction on that. You don't want your sexuality to be a determinant in any way. You want the room to be true to who we are. So you just wanna stand up for that self-respect and respect for others. Um, I saw in the questions, and I'll just uh, someone said, what do you do if your child is telling you that they're gay? Well, I certainly think, you know, you could argue maybe they, maybe it really is a phase if there's, if there's now an environment that, you know, when I was growing up, there was no chance it was a phase because n nobody was coming out to their parents except that they'd been struggling with it for a long, long time. I suppose it's possible 
in the current environment that there's more experimentation and more willingness to kind of identify one way, which may not play itself out. But again, what I would be trying to do with a child if I, I would just be trying to really sort out in a conversation, I would want them to know that I love them and I accept them and I'm gonna be a support for them being true to themselves and true to their best selves. Uh, that that's my job and that because I love them, that's what I'll do. And so I, I think the more a parent is communicating that through how they interact with a child, the more that child feels clear, they don't need to be in rebellion to the parent. They don't need to prove themselves by being in defiance of the parent. And um, how to say it? they can sort of borrow the parent's investment in their well-being and be true to themselves in that. That's the goal. So we never want to be pressured into disidentifying with who we really are because it makes us weaker. And so um, facilitating that ability to be a chooser in your life to choose with dignity about who you really are and to not basically give into pressures outside of yourself to be something less than who you are. That's the goal. Okay, this person says, at what point does it become undignified? This is going back to the modesty question. I have three girls, my oldest is 10. No, it's not undignified yet. It's just, it's not about sexuality at that age. And right now she's been wanting to wear crop tops, tank tops, and we wear shorter shorts. I think she's too young to think, exactly. She's too young to be thinking about her sexuality. I honestly think she just likes them because they're cute and it's hot outside. I completely agree. Um, but I do worry about it going to the opposite direction if we ever talk about it. How do I bring it up organically? We've talked about modesty a lot and her understanding of it is that it's about the clothing. It's how she feels in the clothing and acts in the clothing. Should I bring it up or just let it lie for now? Yeah, I mean, first of all, a prepubescent girl shouldn't be sexualized. And, and I think trying to get her very consci conscious about her body or... Because, yeah, if it's hot and the shorts are working for her little body, um, I would not be saying anything about modesty at that point, personally. Um, I think it's only if I felt in adolescence my girl's were starting to try to emphasize their sexuality to get attention, to get uh, reinforcement. And I felt like it was in some way, in, in a way diminishing their self-respect or they're trying to, if I saw my sons or daughters trying to be something they're not to get the validation of a peer, I would say something to them about it. Um, because it's, a way of standing up for them being true to themselves and not reducing themselves in some way to be something other than who they are. Um, I just think if somebody is really your friend or really cares about you, they won't ask you to be something other than you are or exploit you in some way to get something they want. So it would be in that energy if I thought that's what was happening to my pubescent girls or boys. Okay. Um, because we're out of time, we can't do a role play, but I think those would be valuable. People often say to me that, that they want to hear more role plays. So I think what we could maybe do is next time I do a live, if I'm asking questions and somebody wants their, either their questions being asked or they want to kind of play the part, then we could do more role plays where we're taking up some of these kinds of conversations. So I hope this conversation has been helpful for you. I will think about doing a, a course or at least a brief course to where I'm actually talking to teenage kids. Um, and um, any topics that you think would be particularly helpful that you wish I would be addressing um, in that kind of a course, I would like it be great if you'd email the office and just say, I'd like it if Jennifer were to talk about this in a course. So, uh, for, for talking to kids. 
Okay, thank you everybody. Thanks for being here and uh, happy end of summer and I'll see you in, in September. Bye.